talking about teaching from the balance point by Edward Crutchman. <laughs> we have an hour and five minutes, people, which gives you about... Well, we, the, the request was five minutes of uh, presentation, and then we'll have a general discussion. So let's take it in order of the book, <laughs> which means the person doing the first one is... Johanna. Yeah. So I had the chapter on priority teaching, which I think is a really good chapter and it's really well placed in the book because obviously it's a priority. <laughs> but um, thinking about the overall, the, the core values that you're going to bring to each of your lessons and how you look for that um, is a, a, it's a really good place to put it in the book. Because you could have easily put it a bit further on. Um, he starts off with an anecdote about these two mothers who are waiting with their daughters to go into a group lesson. And one turns the other and says, what piece are you working on? <laughs> and um, they obviously have a conversation about that piece. And he was observing this and thinking, now there's a lot of um, negatives or a lot of um, bad things that can kind of happen. <laughs> Did you turn the TV on? Sorry, Joe. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Just came on suddenly and was like, oh, I'm watching Netflix. <laughs> Back to you, darling. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, but there's there's lots of pitfalls in those kind of conversations um, that can affect a child and a parent's self esteem. In terms can you of just give us the example in case anyone can't remember oh, right, it okay. straight off? So, um, it doesn't have to be read. Just tell us what the conversation is briefly. Yeah, I mean that, that was a conversation that they were talking about what piece they were working on. Um, I think they were both on video at one, in book one, but obviously one... No, 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 no. Have a little look. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. So the bottom of page seven. I'm looking on. Okay. Right, we've suddenly arrived now for three years and we're so proud. We just finished Rightly Road. I thought, no, I thought that was... He was given an alternate kind of conclusion to that conversation. I thought that's how I read that. But the conversation you're saying is a potential pitfall is we've been working for three years, we're on Nightly Row, we're really pleased. Oh, well, we're in book six, so yeah. we won't be seeing you at group class. Like, which yeah. you do hear, like, yeah, yeah, know, sadly, quite and that's, that's, similar conversations quite often. That's not honouring the journey. It's as if he talks about that every child has got their own journey. You don't compare yourself to other people or compare your progress to other people's progress. And that you have no idea what that person has gone through to get that progress and it doesn't honour that at all and it's it's quite a dangerous pitfall. So it's it's better to say um, what are you working on rather than what piece are you working on. Um, and that you could say it's things like I'm, I'm working on being really straight on bows, I'm working on all that sort of thing. So um, it it also it stops reducing the achievements of the of the person to learning the notes of the piece. So it becomes more about the techniques that you're studying and the, the things that you're actually learning. Um, and it it's, makes you less likely to get sick of the pieces. And it gives, lowers your drive to move on so that you can focus on the standard of the piece that you're playing on rather than learning the notes and learning the bowings. Um, so it then talks about priorities and it encourages you to write your top five priorities for living. <laughs> and he, he lists his priorities. Uh, you know, the relationship with, with God and family and um, various different things that you think of when somebody asks that kind of question. Um, but he makes a point that goals aren't priorities. And that is a really key thing to remember, that the things that he mentioned, the things that you're most likely to write down, are goals. It's not your priorities. Your priorities is breathing, eating, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing that if you didn't do it, you would stop existing, mm -hmm. right? So when you whittle things down, um, don't confuse your, your, your teaching goals with priorities. So pieces and um, bowing and learning things from memory is not as important as playing with the balance bow hold and good tone, good intonation, good posture, that sort of thing. So if you focus your teaching on those factors, then you're going to have a much... It might take a slower uptake for the child, 
but they're going to have a much better way of approaching their practice and approaching how they learn and listen to the result that they're getting out of their instrument and experience. So you're focusing on factors that will relate to everything you play, whether you're playing twinkles or a Mozart concerto. Instead of remedial teaching, you're teaching to the priorities, and if you do that from the start, it makes it much easier to continue. And the, once they get going, the, the rate of improvement, they, they own that process more than just you feeding them the notes. And in your own words, because we're coming towards the end of your five minutes, which mm -hmm. I know seems like a long time on paper and then goes very quickly, that was very good so far, thank you. Um, can you tell us how you do that in your lessons? Like, what does teaching to the priority actually look like in terms of, mm -hmm. let's say you've got a child whose vocal is not as you want it to be? So, um, I would... One thing he mentioned, to go back briefly to what he, he said, that often children really want to show you what they've worked on. So he, at the beginning of each lesson, asks them what they want to play for him and let them play the thing without commenting, without saying anything about it, other than at the end giving some positive feedback. But you're watching for the positives, you're watching for things that you could work on to those priorities that you've kind of set in your mind. So if a child presented with a bow hold that wasn't right, if it wasn't played in that piece that you're just getting them to play. If it was in another piece, you'd stop instantly and say, let's look at that. Let's let's sort this out. Let's think about your thumb. Is, is it where I've shown you? And that sort of thing. And then continue. Rather than letting them get to the end of the piece. Um, so I would stop. Say, OK, let's look at that. Your thumb's not in the quite right place for that. Let's see if we can remind ourselves to check it. So I might do a stop check or get them to do a stop check. Excellent. And physically take the bow off and say, is it? Do you yeah. still have that bow hold and put it down? Let's continue. Or I might do a flag game and wave my flag and go, right, stop, check it, and then come back to it. So you're building that with both the child and the parent to stop and check. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how would that turn into a half an hour lesson? Well, let's say you've done the five minutes at the beginning where you've said, show me what you've worked on. I do that at the end personally, but that's fine. Mm. Um, so they've shown you, and you said, you know, great work look at the music to work out which finger the high three is or whatever and then you're going into your priority bit where you're going to try and improve that bow hold mm. what do you do with those 25 minutes that is going to actually help with the bow hold not necessarily jive for anyone like what do you need what is your toolkit for making sure that a child goes away with a better bow hold the parent understands how to practice to keep building on that better bow hold yeah, good. So if you think about your three C's, what are they? Comprehension. Very good. Concentration. Coordination. No, I feel like it should be coordination. It's like it's almost the same. I mean, uh, cooperation. Comprehension. Yes. Cooperation and Joe? Consolidation. Thank you, consolidation. This is where I differ from what um, Ed uses. He says constructive repetition, but I don't. Um, I consolidation, which is essentially the same thing. Um, so if you think about right, the concrete, what you've said is excellent, Kit. Doing it on pencil, <laughs> doing exercises, all of those things are the stuff of making sure that they can do it and that they understand it so that's like here mm -hmm. and then how do we consolidate that you give them repetitions to do so lots of given lots of repetitions to do you put it into a twinkle and you say to them okay do do that for the twinkles before you start practicing the piece so take a box out of the piece and say okay that you're going to look at it in that place then build from there yep so you could count how many in a lesson you get the parent to count how many Very good. Uh, there's one particular word that I'm looking for. I'm sure you've all got it in your heads. What's the toolkit that will help you build a better bow hold? Repetition. Take a picture. <laughs> Video. Let's say you're a minuet three. Here's Twinkle. 
How much of that pie chart do we need to use to remember how Twinkle goes if you're at the end of book one? Like nothing. Like about this much, yeah? <coughs> That's remembering the structure of the piece, the bowing desks. Uh, easy peasy, you can practically do it in your sleep. Yeah. So then you can think, okay, then we're working on the bow board, let's say. So we'll take out a little bit for uh, what happened at school today, a little bit more for what am I going to have for dinner tonight, a little bit more for am I pleasing my teacher, and then we've got all of this for thinking about the bow hold. Mm. If you are on minuet three, how much of that do you need to think about the piece? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it will look the same, but this is the notes, the rhythms, the fingers, the bowing, yeah? So then you're going to take out, am I pleasing my teacher, is my mum cross with me, uh, what am I going to have for dinner, someone was mean to me at school, or I had a great day at school, and how much do we have left for bow hold? Like, <laughs> that. <laughs> so that is not going to lead you to having a better bow hold after a week of practice, if that's how you're spending most of your time. Mm. So we come back to the ratio of practice being, for, for book ones at least, 70, 70 to 75% review. And then in that 25% left, a little bit of sight reading, some boxes in your working piece, and go at the working piece. Mm. Or several goes, yeah? <clears throat> but like six or seven review pieces, you can play the flag, you can stop check, you can have mum or dad sitting on the floor looking up, because also if you're thinking about, particularly about the right thumb, it's very hard to see it if you're yeah. sitting face to face. And the children love this, because like if you, you know, you say, right, sorry dad, you've got to sit on the floor underneath them and they've got to stand there and play for you and then you can wave the flag, because that's the only way that you can see if that thumb has gone straight. Mm. And you can count how many times you had to wave the flag, or you can stop and start again every time you wave the flag, or you can have two pots and I get a coin or a, you know, like Lego piece or whatever, mm. every time I see that you've done a whole bar with a good bow hold, and and or you get a thing every time you've done a bow with a good bow hold and I get a thing every time I see that it's gone wrong and then the, the child will notice it going into the gone wrong one and fix it <clears throat> and if they don't then they're not ready for that yet mm. but all of those kind of things are going to mean <coughs> obviously the pie chart on my left is going to improve the bow hold Approximate. markedly faster mm. yeah, yeah. and I think that that's the thing <coughs> this book is amazing in many ways but it is a book for everyone, and so therefore it's not, I don't think, that, I, I think it would have been great if there's a little bit more kind yeah. of clarity about how you do that, because this is something I've heard from so many teachers, like I understand I'm trying to teach brilliant posture and good intonation and good tone as my three priorities, but how do I do that? Like, mm -hmm. how do your students do that and how do I not? I don't know mm -hmm. what it looks like to do that differently, mm -hmm. and that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I was all, I've also <clears throat> been wondering if they're the same priorities in a group lesson. Because they're definitely my I don't think so. In individual lesson. It would be great to have a group priority if we can think of Okay, that. let's do that next time we talk about group lessons. Oh, probably two weeks from today. No, I'd love sooner. To, well, it's just I feel like I'm I'm struggling with my book three group. Okay, um, so it would be really helpful. But we'll do it next week because I do want to finish the sight reading. Ooh, it's like one of those tracking <laughs> cameras. I do want to finish the um, the sight reading thing today that we started last week. So uh, I will make a note to change that for next week. Okay, but, but anything else that people are burning to discuss? No? Okay, no. cool. Right, um, Joe, back to you. Do you want to just wrap up if there's anything else? No, it's pretty much that top, because anything after that, we, he talked about uh, prior to teaching rather than linear teaching. Um, and that you we already spoke about the stop and fix thing, but you can it makes it easier for you to track the different... Um, influences on the priorities through the pieces. So if you're having problems with the bow hold, say, for example, and it's a problem in Twinkle, or and the, the student is in book two or whatever, you can still use another book one piece that further develops the thumb action, for example. You know, you know, you're, you know where to pull that through because it's going to the priority. Um, so it can be frustrating for both the parent and the child, and you've got to, the, the Takeaway from that for me is that you have to manage your expectations um, 
and build that motivation accordingly and that actually you're building excitement in the fact that they're achieving the priority and achieving the skill rather than um, them feeling like they've been stuck on Twinkles for how long. Because it, mm. be, it can be, especially if they're in a group and there's lots of other children who are at their level, it could be really demoralising for them to be, oh, we're still just doing this. Um, um, we talked about getting the students to play through one piece, um, but also you, you've got to train them to watch for positive comments. So no matter what the student's doing, that the parent is learning how to positively comment on what that child is doing, because it gives them both a chance to see that, that progression. Yeah. And then the last point he makes is that you know, the book one group lessons become about more than just playing the... I do also think that, that it is a trap that we can fall into, and especially I fell into it as a, as a new teacher many moons ago, um, <laughs> to try and teach a child how to play everything perfectly from the, or, or like to, for them to be perfect in book one. And I think one of the things that's great about this way of teaching is that it works wherever you are. So if you feel that you're like the, you know, our fundamental top priority, actually not like for teaching what we teach, this is, I agree, but what is our fundamental priority, big, big, big picture? Is that they love it and enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. You have to make them want to play. Motivation has got to be the top priority because otherwise they will stop. Doesn't matter if they've got a perfect bow hold all the way through book one. If they feel crap because they haven't made fast enough progress to keep up with their friends, <coughs> then they'll quit and <laughs> their perfect bow hold all the way through book one means nothing, doesn't it? Mm. So um, the, the priority has got to be the joy. And sometimes I think that we can get bogged down in trying to make a four year old play perfectly. And actually, you know, they have to learn to play. And then you can get more sort of specific about how they play the the sound that the tone and the intonation like for posture for me they've got to be comfortable if they're uncomfortable they're not going to want to play so that's a real problem and you know the basics have got to be there but i think what i'm talking about is that you can like spend weeks trying to get a little finger that's there but the right shape to there <laughs> and you know I, I i think that's more like a book two three kind of thing to think about um the intonation has to be good, otherwise it sounds horrible, and no one wants to practice if it sounds horrible, and ditto the tone. So I do agree with this, but I just don't want you to kind of go away thinking like they've all got to look like those, you know, the kind of perfect Suzuki student at all times, otherwise I'm not teaching to the priority, because the top, top priority, as I said, is the joy, and it's got to be there at least most of the time. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much, Jo. Well done. Um, next we have Devon. Yes. So, um, the chapter I was looking at is note versus wrote, and the first thing I had to do was figure out what wrote meant. Um, and I'm actually a bit confused about this because um, he says, when he, he's giving an example of um, giving instructions through sort of detailed written instructions, and he says, the first method, learning by rote, I must give you some very detailed instructions that would sound like this. But when I looked up the definition of rote, it said learning through repetition. So mm. I'm not I'm not sure who's making the mistake, him or me or I think the point that he's trying to make is mm. that if you note versus wrote, it's a nice, like, neat little phrase, but it doesn't really tell you what he means. I think mm. what he's talking about is learning everything through instructions or learning things by ear using mm. instructions that you've understood and can apply to anything. So I will teach you how to get to this place. You've got to learn all of these directions. And if you go wrong in one place, you're suddenly mm. going to be in the wrong part of the city yeah. versus you know, there's that landmark over there, that means you're going in the right direction. Uh, you can look at, you know, this, these, like these streets are in a grid. So if you understand that they're in a grid, you can, you, as long as you know you've got to cross it, you can walk anywhere you want towards that particular landmark. And then you've just got to remember, like, it's the third on the left one time. Because you kind of have the map of the city in your head, rather mm -hmm. than every single individual instruction 
-hmm. So learning by rote in a Suzuki context would be like the parents who are saying to a kid who's on perpetual motion, it goes A, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 1, E, E. And if the kid runs out of notes, they're like, what's the next note? And the parent just tells them. They've got no understanding of how to find the note through having had it inside their head. Yeah. And if you imagine trying to do that without ever listening to a piece, then yeah. that's the only, like, you're reliant on the person who's looking at the music to tell you because you can't read it yourself. So it's like every single individual note, that's the learning by rote bit. It's like you just have to learn every single individual note, whereas learning by ear is having the song in your head and understanding how the instrument works so that you can, if you can't remember the next note, you can listen to it in your head and you can find it by trial and error and therefore there it is. Yeah, okay. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Thanks. So Kate's, yeah. Kate's just explained a lot of this. I guess what I was going to talk about, but... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, so he uses three, three examples. One is very detailed written instructions. The next one is a map, um, a visual map. And then the third one is an example of someone driving in a car every day to get to a certain place. Um, and then after a month, they remember how to get to that place because they've seen all the landmarks and they know basically where to go. Um, and when I first read this, I. I was next to my girlfriend and I was like, hey, this is like a really good example of the mother tongue approach and why it works. Um, because, especially if you're learning and if you're a child, you can have, you can have some, a grasp of like, oh, this is what an A looks like on the music or, you know, this is a three on the A. But if you're sort of talking that through or trying to play a piece, then there's a, a sort of process of like, oh, okay, I know that, but I have to think three on the A or where's, you know, which string is it on? Um, all these different things. Whereas if you're just listening to something, you can hear it and then you can sing it immediately after you have, you sort of know what it is, it is just intuitively. And so that's kind of the same thing. Like if you've been going through the same, um, journey every day then you're gonna just know oh that's where the church is we turn left and that's where that is um, so yeah I just thought it was a really good example um, and then he also says how um, he says oh if you're trying to read a map or read instructions while you're going to that place then that's just gonna be a nightmare and you're not gonna be able to drive your car and sort of same thing with if you're trying to read music and play the violin at the same time and remember your bow hold and all that other stuff. Um, and then he goes into um, how he'd start students out with um, saying, I'm gonna play you two notes, which one is higher or lower? And I think understanding that, which I've already sort of started to understand anyway, but it's just a really good, like before I sort of thought of teaching a child to read music as a very daunting process because reading music is quite difficult. Um, but starting out in that sort of way in where you can grasp, oh yeah, that's higher or lower, then it becomes very easy to show a child, you know, that note is higher on the page and then you can hear, oh, it's also higher, you know. And so, yeah, it's just a very good starting point in terms of learning to read music or t teaching reading music. Um, and that was basically most of the chapter. Yeah, great. Could you sum up what you think is the key point? I mean, you kind of have just done that, but like mm -hmm. one sentence conclusion. Um, one sentence conclusion is... In terms of like, what do, what do the parents really need to understand in order to make this all work? Um, that the, the child needs to learn through listening and music um, because that will be the most intuitive way for them to understand reading music and playing music. Excellent. So this is like a whole brilliant example of why the listening is so important. 
and also for us as teachers, like if you are having trouble with your memory of certain pieces, listen to it more times. Mm -hmm. Even if you're already listening every single day, listening to it more, it won't solve every problem. You do have to have those maps and those understandings about layer cakes or whatever, whichever way works for you, but it makes a huge difference. And also with speech shifter or you know any tune, like things on your phone that you can slow things down. Like if you're struggling with do 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 just listen to it slowly. Like that will really go in, and it's like magic practice. You can do it on the tube. No one knows you're practicing your violin. <laughs> so, good, great, thank you, Devin. Well done. Sorry for slightly uh, taking over. <laughs> okay, Kit, posture. If you want to do the same thing, actually. So. Uh, the notes I wrote was like posture is the first priority because the posture <coughs> allows you to develop all the skills. Um, so making sure, um, like you're relaxed at the beginning, so then you can just clear your mind and just start really from the, like the bottom up because it's really starting from the ground. Making sure like your feet are. Like we're like glued to the floor, like something's pulling your feet down to make sure they're secure. Um, and the we're kind of in order, just saying yeah about the re relaxing first and just. And then about the different, the rest position feet. So just, you know, keeping your feet together. And then just because you're resting, you don't really need to do much. But then when you go into playing, you just want to, you know, put your foot just width apart. But just, you know, making sure that you're comfortable. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like roots in the floor. Um, and then with the violin posture, just um, having a really good setup, like really doing the, well, let us say it, the stop the traffic, mm -hmm. to make sure that you know you know where, like how everything goes, the movements. Then once you don't have to think about what you're doing, it's so often you just know the correct place to put the violin, and that just to know that you're the main thing is that you're not holding the violin from your left yeah, left hand, it's your chin and your shoulder that's doing all the work. So even just, like it says here, like putting your violin, you know, on a table and just holding it by the, the chin rest and then just seeing that, you know, you don't need that much pressure, <coughs> but also like on the wall, the gravity's going to do it, so you're just going to be just that little bit with your left hand, just kind of just not holding it, but just like just making sure that like because if you're going to do it a lot, if you're going to have bad posture, then your violin's going to be low, like going to the ground, so then you're not going to then you're going to have to hold it up with the hand because your shoulder and chin, your yeah, shoulder and chin aren't going to be able to just relax. You're going to have to work harder to try and really dig deep. And, and hold it so if your left hand's gonna um, have to hold it a bit more. Um, and then it was about just showing on the images about yeah, the other girl, you know, putting it down and the hand is already just like she's gonna catch it just to be make sure it's there. And then showing that if you really just put it up in that spot, that you can literally just hold it, the violin by itself with your chin and shoulder. Um, and then it was also said um, that making sure that if obviously if you're teaching your parent can see the right way of where to position your, your, um, your violin it will help you explain it to the child if they're struggling because the child can only know if it's right or not if it's uncomfortable because that's a big thing so if it's obviously not comfortable then they're gonna obviously not be able to know like where to put it but then if the parent or teacher says okay 
you know, is it comfortable here? Is it comfortable there? Then the, the child can think about, oh yeah, it's comfortable to, to remember that once, you know, they do the right setup and then they find that comfortable position, they know that's the right position and the parent can be like, oh yeah, you know, just lift it up just a little bit more because, you know, just remember it's going to be in this where it's comfortable and I like to help the child um, find that comfortable spot. And what can make it uncomfortable that you need to be aware of? Um, is that to do with the... 30, 31? Yeah, that was the chin the or shoulder pads thing. Yeah. So if it's like the wrong way, or if it's not quite, if it's like too high or too low as well, it won't be responsible to sit there comfortably without you really having to hold up your left hand. You just, just want to sit nicely. Yeah, if that doesn't work, just get your teacher to help you fix And lots again. of those chin rests on the little cheek violins are really sharp under the chin. Mm -hmm. So lots of the time I will put like a different chin rest on or some, you know, the, the, the padded bit from like a roll of plaster rather than individual plasters across the metal bit. I think a lot of kids look at the chin rest and they see these metal things and they think that's what's hurting me. And when you look at them when they're playing, it's not even touching their neck because it's not like jammed in there, right? But it just like psychologically to put something over the top of it just to kind of sort it out. So I think, um, you know, obviously you need to check the hardware is actually right as well as everything that you're talking about. Brilliant, thank you. Keep going, please. Um... And then just talk a tiny bit about habit and how that can play into it. Oh, so I would I don't know if I'd say so I wouldn't use the word habit. But I don't know if this is correct what I think. It's not like habits, just remembering the steps to then, oh no. Well like, okay, well we just did take me literally for example with me, because I'm always still working on my posture and everything, just remembering those little steps, because then that will make your life easier. Mm. Um, so in the long run, those little steps are going to be able to like help you in, in the long run. So like me, I'm always remembering, you know, you got to put your, you know, you got to put the shoulder, the shoulder rest, yeah, where the crease is on your on your t-shirt, so then you know it's high enough. And then, you know, then it's just, you literally just turning and tilting and everything, so it's just comfortable, which will help in the long run create a better sound and more comfortable and be easier to play and everything. Exactly, and one day you'll realise you're not thinking about that anymore, you haven't thought yeah. about the crease on your t-shirt for ages, yeah. because you created the new habit. Mm. Exactly, perfect answer. Yeah. I think the other thing about habits is that children can a new habit can feel uncomfortable because it's unfamiliar. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you've had a kid who's come in like this, mm -hmm. or who's developed that, let's say, over the summer holidays or something, you know, this is the thing, you can be the best teacher in the world. <coughs> Your students will still come back with weird things having happened to their body just because they're growing all the time, you know, like they get chicken pox, they've got a, you know, they've got a spot there that's uncomfortable and suddenly they come back after a week just playing like this because they've just literally developed a new habit out of something completely unrelated to violin and you have to help them to build the new habit back into the right one. Um, but I think that often they say that it hurts because it feels weird. Yeah. And so it's about those you know, pie charts again, about like find ha what makes them comfortable, what makes them convinced that they are comfortable, and then make sure that you explain to them that it's a new feeling and that the old feeling might feel more familiar and therefore that's why they want to go back to it, but they've just got to turn the, the new feeling into the one that's more, more familiar and then they'll be able to do it all the time. I would say also look at their clothes because one of my students last week, I was struggling to think, why is she suddenly, we worked so hard on her posture and it was really set up mm. and then she, it's dipping and it's because she's gone to a different stage in school and they're wearing shirts right and proper shirt collars and now. it's like slipping and it's not just slipping it's like because it's quite substantial um she now but it's been comfortable for her it's now she puts the violin in a different place and it mm. droops mm. i'm like okay i can't i can't do anything like if it's a polo shirt you can kind of like mess with it 
But as it's a starch shirt collar, I've said we can't play in that shirt until you're much older yeah. and you know what to do. But I don't know. If you know, you want to try putting it up. It's, it doesn't matter. I, I used to have a shirt like that at school. There's okay. no way you can put it where it doesn't completely get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. And just bring a t shirt to your yeah. lesson and take it off. Yeah. Yeah. They have to do that. And yeah. you might have noticed in Greek as well. I, I tell you what, I did a gig once in a new dress because we were going up north and it, I knew it was going to be freezing. It was like February in this like 800 year old stone church. Oh my God. So I bought this velvet long sleeve dress because all my dresses were like um, short sleeved and I played this unaccompanied bar walking around, which is a thing that I do a lot. And the bloody dress was so slippy. I had to like, I, I screwed up the memory. <laughs> so I was thinking, it's like exactly, it's the pie charts of your brain yeah. again. I was so worried about dropping the violin. I was walking around p performing fast on a company bar. I just went round the, the wrong. I went off the wrong exit and had to just play a whole extra bit. And uh, <laughs> one person did say to me, at the end, "I enjoyed your extended bar." <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's why I can tell you. <laughs> I'm so worried about dropping yeah. my violin onto the stone floor. Um, so yeah. Like Clothing um, can make a big difference. Yeah. Improvising Shakespeare when someone gets their line on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. And then that horror when you think, oh my god, I'm, I'm in the wrong bit of the piece. What am I going to do? And then you just think, well, I can't do anything. Like, I can't, I can't skip to a different place. I'm just going to have to play like one and a half times around this partita. Sorry, guys. Hope you're enjoying it. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> anyway, uh, anything else you'd like to add? That was very good. Do you want to talk about the right hand at all or not? Um, I don't know, it's like it does really, but not really so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think for yourself, not from the book, is the most important thing in terms of balance of the bow hand? Like, how do we make sure that it's balanced and that each finger and the thumb are doing the appropriate amount of work rather than the thumb doing nothing, for example? Or I would say kind of like they're all kind of working the same. They're all not like one finger or two is not really doing anything. They're all just kind of... Like you know, the main you know the main pinky and the thumb really mostly do a lot of work, but you you can just subconsciously or whatever know that that all the fingers are like kind of gripped and they're all kind of like holding it down and everything. If that makes sense. Yeah. Can you just reword gripped and holding it down? <laughs> well done. Uh, and and holding it down, you could rephrase as. A bit more Suzuki. Like, what do we talk about with the string? Good contact. Yeah, contact or connection or feeling the string. Yeah, because like holding it down, sort of like, you know, it's a squashy thing to do, isn't it? Whereas feeling the contact, like squeezy bow hand. Yeah, Dr. Suzuki apparently said tight but flexible about the bow hold. Um, Obviously, you don't want it too loose, otherwise you're just pushing the bow up and down and then you're entirely uh, relying on the quality of your instrument to get the sound or not. Whereas, if you really want to sculpt to the sound, then you need your hand to be, you know, flexible but connected with the string. Yeah, excellent. I think the big uh, problem that lots of kids get with their bow holds, lots of people get with their bow holds, that we need to watch out for is too much pronation. So that means twisting towards the top. So the one is like grabbing and then the fourth finger comes straight like that. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have the flexibility in the knuckles. You don't, the thumb may still be bent, but it can't really do anything because it's all clamped up there. So it's about like making sure that you're between those two joints on the first finger and that you've got like a right angle or maybe even slightly more than a right angle between the stick and the first finger. Yeah? yeah? I was just saying the biggest risk I think with most kids and people's bow holds is the, is the kind of clamping the front around so you're pronating and then you lose the flexibility at the bottom.
bottom. What does turn mean? It just means turning towards the front, towards the one, okay. like twisting. And some people teach that, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Because it's a way you can get a big sound, because you kind of tip the weight of the arm into it, but it brings the elbow up. It's so uncomfortable on your wrist as well. I mean, it's much more the... Oh, I can't remember which I don't know. school. Anyway, yeah, so it's about that that angle, staying open, not letting it, yeah. So like a... Almost like a right angle, yeah, pretty much. Maybe even slightly more. But then you also... Let's just get the bows for this discussion. It's silly to be doing it on pencil. Because yeah. <laughs> we also teach to have... Part of the way I remember learning is having this more like 45 degree angle. Yeah, so that's what I was saying, more than, well, 45, like, you know, just get your bow off, get your bow Yeah. Can you freeze them? Oh, good, that's, that's good. I haven't even seen one here. No, no, no. Are you cold? No. 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 <laughs> How are you? You're wearing your fine, yeah. sort of jacket. Yeah. How's your temperature now? I think it's cold. Yeah. It's on the cooler side. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put one on in just a little bit more. So... I think the thing that you want to watch out <coughs> for is this angle getting small there. Because that's when they've, they've if they're um, grabbing with the first finger, this gets closed up. Mm. So you want that, you know, swan's neck sort of, yeah, more than 90 degrees. So I talk about the first finger and the contact point of the first finger never being beyond the crease. Definitely, yeah, that you want it between those two joints, yeah? Yeah, um, and that there's a little bit of variability there. Yeah. And then also the, the backward C there, so it's not mm, the yeah. mouthy hole. Yeah. So it's not making that shape, but more that shape. Yeah. But then the other thing, yeah, we'll get, later on I do this kind of floppy bow hole where I hold that at 45 degrees, and then the idea is that your fingers are more at a slant. Well, that they're always like that, so that's how I teach it. But they're at a slant. Why do you want it more at a slant? So that when you do finger flexibility things, you're not pushing the bow that way, you're pushing it. Oh, you're talking about like book four? Uh, yeah. Um, I think that's fine, but I think you still, I think that's good, and I agree, but I think you still want the normal bow hold for like most of the bow to be like you don't you don't want like the like the third finger over the spot do you? Uh, I, I don't that think would that increase way. pronation. So that's what that is. The pronation is the tilting of the hand upwards towards the So you don't want pronation? No. Yeah. I guess it's also the, the angle of the wrist to the hand. Mm -hmm. Like trying to keep that smooth. But don't you have to have a, a bit of pronation? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can think of pronation as being like very much like lifting the back of the hand so that you like press into the first finger. It's this like this wrist position. That's pronation. And then obviously, so yeah, you would say like as you come towards the heel, we are slightly pronating, but that's just part of like having a flexible low hand. It's also which part of your fingers touching the bow, is it the flat underside or is it the side bit here? Because if it's pronating... It yeah, exactly, the pronation will turn it towards the yeah. side more. Yeah. So I think that the 45 degree thing is really helpful for when you're talking about finger flexibility and mm -hmm. finger action, but I wouldn't introduce it as an idea as to how you want to hold the bow because I think you'll find this happening a lot. On that because I am really um, careful about where the contact mm. point is on the index finger. So then if you're talking about 45 degrees but then I'm doing it, why is it helpful to think about 45 degrees? I am, I, I do have 45 degrees-ish, even though I'm not pronating, so, but I don't really understand how that's happening. <laughs> Oh, you're talking about the first finger. I thought you were yeah. talking about the second finger. No, yeah, because you're bending your finger. That's how it's happening. Yeah. Okay. 
one of the things I really struggled with was getting my bow hold to be a bit more balanced. Mm -hmm. And you still get turned about that. Yeah, but I actually, my soft knuckles because yeah. I'm getting very confused as to where to have my middle fingers. Yes, contacting the stick, but when you start playing, that all changes. Yeah. And it's difficult to kind of. I think really for the middle fingers, it's those it's those creases, yeah. isn't it, that yeah. really are contacting. And for for the kids, it's so easy to think about their fingertips because that's what mm. they're used to thinking about. But and also, it's difficult to remember that their fingers are going to be shorter. Then the proportions of their hands are going to be different to our longer fingers as we get older. Your fingers don't get proportionally longer as you get bigger. I don't Everything know, just gets bigger. Chunky little hands is yeah, some longer. of them, but that within a normal range of like some adults' children, adults' children, adults' fingers are shorter than others. Mm. It's not that you know they've got the equivalent of this. <laughs> and then we turn into that. It's stubby little hands. <laughs> so unless you've got a very unusual child. Mm. The proportions <coughs> should be the same from the bow and the fingers and everything. Mm. But the bow actually, the bow is less, uh, it's obviously shorter, but the stick is almost as wide as our stick. Yeah. And the hair width is almost, like it feels like the main difference in the, yeah. the bow is the bow length. So yeah, so it can be difficult to, because when but the, look at the, my the fingers. the frog, the frog is smaller. Not very much though. Well, yeah, yeah. Go and look at a six anyway, yeah. this, we're getting off point, but a sixteenth yeah. size bow does have a much smaller frog. Mm. And yeah, I agree, it doesn't make the, the stick doesn't get that much thinner because they would just snap too easily. Mm. But we're not really talking about holding the stick as in feeling the width of the stick, we're talking about where we contact it, aren't we? Mm. Why is um teaching this bow hold easier for a child at the beginning? Uh, but very briefly, bigger muscle groups control mm -hmm. bigger, like if you're holding something that feels bigger because you're holding it differently, mm. it's easier to build the muscle control. And it will still be in the same spot on the thumb and everything, because sometimes I feel like if you have a super small hand, it's almost like harder to... So I teach the thumb on the silver and the hair, and I think this is really vital, and I don't understand why so many people teach it down there, because I've seen so many people teach it on the silver, which means it slides around all the time, you can't really get a good purchase on it, and also, if you're on the silver, then when you move your thumb inside, you're moving it up, as well as in. Whereas if you're teaching it here, that is literally exactly the same place as touching a little bit of the frog, but mostly the stick. So it's identical, the angle of the thumb is identical in relation to the rest of the hand, it's just closed in more. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't it that the bones of the wrist don't finish forming properly till they're about seven? I might be wrong on that, but... I mean, the bones of anyone don't finish forming properly until you're, what, 18? Well, it depends yeah. how long you grow for, right? 18, because yeah. But isn't it also keep growing? Like, uh, you don't want to develop too much tension, because actually... If they've got a relaxed bow hand and their thumb is on the outside, it's easy to control the bend in that thumb. So that when yeah, it's about building able, the right muscles, yeah. the right muscle control, yeah. rather than them squeezing. Yeah, that if you if you make it a, a smaller, that's you know like a, little kids sometimes have those big sort of chunky bits around their pencils. Mm -hmm. It's the same idea, like holding a pencil that's that thin is much harder <coughs> to get your your muscles to cooperate with something that is like hard to pick up, like babies can't pick up peas when they can pick up a carrot. Mm. No, it's the same thing, like picking up a pea is a really, like, <laughs> weirdly important part of child development. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> oh, me! Um, I would just laugh at that child, that's why I'm laughing at that <laughs> <laughs> I'm But really like, laughing. so it's gross motor skills basically, mm. and so it's the same thing with the pencils, they put a big chunky thing on it so that they can hold it correctly, bigger, while those muscles are developed, and then as they get more control over their muscles and the muscles develop in the right way, they become smaller. Okie dokie, well done everybody. Lovely kit, thank you. Can I just ask as well though, putting the thumb in that, plate, that spot on the bow hair against the ferrule um, also means that you can kind of like just tilt the thumb a little bit because there is still an angle of 
And yeah, you can come that, and go in. I would say that's to have degrees. Degrees. Yeah, absolutely not. We don't want that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. And it's on that top corner, you know, and I often yeah. put like a little dot here and say, that's the secret dot and you don't want to show anyone else because it's your secret that you want to keep <laughs> quiet. Right. We are behind. <laughs> uh, no, we're not, actually. 15 minutes. Cool. Hannah. Okay. We're going to jump through to this thing. 67. So, um, Craig, Craigman he talks about listening in other places in the book too. So, um, Beth and Devin's, Devin's example of the rope or the note um, aspect, but this, this brings it together a bit. Um, so, the first thing he talks about is. Um, mother tongue method basically and um, wanting to create a, a musical environment um, so that we, we internalize the music in it, in, in, by ear. Um, he calls this passive listening um, and he recommends as we do to listen every day um, and then gives some kind of technical advice on what kind of equipment which is very outdated. <laughs> um, yes. Having multiple copies of the reference recording, which is again pretty outdated because uh, it's, it's an old book. I still recommend that though. Because if somebody's got Do more you? than one way, yeah, from like, if you've got a computer that's got a CD drive, just burn a copy and just leave it there. Leave it where? I don't have a CD player in my house. Do you? If you've got a computer or a games console that has CD ROM drive. If you've got a computer, why wouldn't you just have it on the hard drive? Yeah, I think that multiple parents having the recordings yeah. and actually the kids are sometimes having access to their own music. I, I have a kid who was like six when they started giving him his own little music station and with headphones and everything. And he did have a CD actually. So it, it, it yeah, talking about different ways of listening. Yeah, I was going to say, what would you, I mean, this book is from 1998. Uh, yeah. What would you? recommend now? Um, well, obviously, I've got a problem listening to the current recordings because they're not there. So yeah. figuring that out is, a pro I would love to figure that, that oh, out. Yeah, so but um, I do recommend making sure that their quality of their speaker is good. Um, I recommend making it easy for the kids to be able to put it on themselves. Um, some, some parents seem to have little toys, little tiny ones, where they can press a button and, and the, like even in a cot kind of thing, and the music will play. Um, it just looks like a little person or something. You can get different shaped ones and they can play those themselves. Cute. Um, and then, yeah, just getting into a habit. So even if they can kind of get it on a timer and then um, have it play it. Um, so, as well as playing the current repertoire, Kreitman recommends getting like a much more advanced um, Suzuki book. I, instead of that, I, I recommend other musics to listen to, um, the violinist side, or violinist, or I also recommend listening to the cellist, who I like the cello, um, but I encourage them to find their own um, equivalents as well as um, using my and then try and I I include a broad spectrum of music not just um, the classical music and they seem to like that so that's good um, then he let he uses this game where we'll do it now um, you've got 10 seconds to, to look at everything brown in the room so 10 9 One, close your eyes. Okay, we're going to start with Devon. Can you say something brown? The wood. Uh, Joanna? Me. 
sorry, can you clarify the word? Um, the, the word over there. Close your eyes. Um, <laughs> what? That makes up the, the frame of the window. Okay. Okay. Collins. Linens. Uh, and bows. Okay. The dog. Stubborn. Oh, I was going to say the dog. Is the dog even in here? No, yeah. it's just here. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, that was all I got so far. Um, the didgeridoo in the corner, which is br- fairly brown. Good. It's not a didgeridoo, it's a rain stick. Oh, a rain stick. Just FYI. <laughs> okay. Uh, the doors. Okay. The chairs. The table thing with the chairs. Seven. Um, I can't remember any other ones. Anyone else? Uh, the, the trim on the windowsill. I'm not sure if that's what um, Devon meant before. Okay, you can tell us my jacket. <laughs> okay, so um, now close your eyes again. We're going to go around and list everything red. Uh, Joe. Mm. Can't do it. Okay. You know this room. Kate's not allowed to do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm still struggling to open my violin case. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, Devin? Uh, the cover for my violin. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you've got your eyes open again. Yeah. Oh, that's what I can see. Devin, give us all you can. That, that's it. I don't have anything Okay. Else. <laughs> yes. Oh. So, so, the idea with this game, and I actually did, I did it in, my, in one of my classes this week, it's really helpful, is to show you that if you're not look, looking for something in particular, you can completely ignore um, the details of something. Um, I've seen videos as well <coughs> online where there's like yeah. a guy dressed as a giant yeah, gorilla or something. Yeah, something. Runs across the screen and nobody saw it. Yeah, and nobody <laughs> sees it because you're looking for something else. Um, so that could be a fun, fun little thing. <laughs> to Make sure you bring in your gorilla costume. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, to bring in active listening. Um, and he talks about it. In, in recordings and then he gives a priority list or whatever again. Um, let's run through it. And so he get uh, he says the priority is just to get the notes and rhythm of the piece, so you're listening for that. Then listening for the bowings, um, listening for the simple articulations, staccato versus legato. Listen listening for the musical line and direction of the notes. So he talks about I think arrival notes. Um, listening for the form of the piece, the structure, listening for dynamic contrasts, listening for fingerings, positions, portamento and vibrato. What does portamento mean? It's like the shifting that you do. Audible shifting. Okay. Yeah. Um, listening for advanced bowings, um, so on, off the string, staccato, ricochet, etc. Listening for ornamentation, listening for advanced interpretation. Um, and, and you can compare different artists' musical ideas. Um, so, yeah, you can kind of set the parents' specific and children's specific um, listening tasks. Um, I thought, and, and I can't remember what you said, but the, what I was thinking about it is how useful it is for then your own playing, because um, you start really listening for different things in your sound. He talks elsewhere about the start, middle, and end of, of a note, um, and, and says that that was one of the most like transformative, um, that is one of the most transformative things he talks about with, with his kids and listening. Um, and also elsewhere he talks about um, recording your own playing, and how with more advanced students, um, that can be, extremely helpful tool to improve their musicianship. So, yeah, it's uh, that's what I found more interesting in this, is like, not so much the mother tongue listening everyday stuff, but the more detailed listening um, and how to kind of approach it step by step um, for the kids mm. yeah, at a more advanced level maybe. But even at the beginning, you can talk about staccato and legato. And yeah, dynamics and things. But the dynamics don't, uh, often don't match the, 
But they're much better on Hillary yeah. Harnell. Yeah, okay, so I don't think that's any um, You can get the Hillary Harnell, this is why I've been looking at my phone, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, you can get the Hillary Harnell, I'm just trying to see if you can get the Heatherly versions of Suzuki, um, but four to six. Thank you, Hannah. Very good. Any questions about any of that? Yeah. Could you clarify what you meant about the beginning, middle, end of the bow? Of end the of, the, of the note. Yeah. yeah so sustain and release. Exactly. Mm. It attacks the sustain and release. Okay, yeah. So I usually think about articulation being the beginning or end or combination. That it's also the between the the, the between the notes. You're listening to. Mm. Um, with attack and release. Um, yeah, you can't really articulate the middle of the note, can you? Like, the, the articulation is about how the notes are put together. So yeah. that's the start and the beginning. The, the start and the end. The start and the end. Yeah. And then the middle of the note is kind of, it's like the vowel sound of a word. It can actually have multiple things going on, like with the casal spelling. Mm. Um, you're, it's more the bow stroke than what's happening with the fingers, I guess, that you're um, looking for, because fingers will change the melody. Um, Certainly before you have vibrato, yeah, yeah. once you have vibrato. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Good. Great. Uh, right. Wonderful presentations, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm going to just talk about a few tiny bits from the other bits of the book. So, um, can you turn to page 48, please? So, basic terminology. I do think lots of people, and I, this is borne out by teaching on workshops and group lessons and stuff, lots of people don't remember what tone and intonation actually are. Um, so I think intonation is a really good sort of little trick for them to remember. Um, and I've read this many times, but I haven't read it for a while. And it is exactly true what he says about like, turn the TV down, or would you please turn it up? And then you take the violin and, you know, you, you think of the, um, the top of the violin being the scroll because we've got the neck and the shoulders. So you think of it as being like that way but then it's turned sideways and like this is all just very confusing for a non-musical, like a non, not as in unmusical, but like a, a, someone who doesn't understand about string instruments already, mm -hmm. um, to understand that the pitch to go higher has to go towards the bridge and to go lower has to go towards the scroll because there are all sorts of like confusing elements, you know, like when people say, make your finger higher, well, they can only be talking about the pitch because this is along. Mm. This is side to side. Yeah? I mean, you might be very slightly on an angle <coughs> downwards, but you know, if you're trying to get your kids to play with a pretty much straight violin, you don't want to be emphasizing down and up, apart from in terms of pitch. So make the sound higher and lower, make the note higher and lower, not move your finger. And then also, if you ever do anything with cellists, it's an absolute nightmare unless you're really talking about pitch because move your finger lower means that on the cello mm -hmm. and this is getting higher but that's literally the opposite to what it is in space whereas at least ours is just like doesn't make sense it's side to side so it's really I think that was a great little example of how we have to be really super clear about what we're saying and try and take out all the assumed knowledge that we know because the parents and the children don't have that necessarily we, we also have that with and we have yeah. the brass cellos when you're crossing the string to the lower string, they're like that's yeah, higher yeah. on yeah. the ground. Yeah. And even the just down and up bows, because when you do a down bow, your bow, the contact point of your bow moves higher. This is a down bow, but you're moving up the bow. This is an up bow, but you're moving down the bow. So pull and push are much more helpful. The French have it <laughs> in this in that particular way. So I just thought that that was worth sort of um, revisiting. I find uh, just a little bit of early theory is helpful with that as well. Um, I find oh, this is the pen that works well. 
sorry, I stole it. Um, and talk about um, the, the first two bits of theory I want them to learn are finding the E and the A. Um, but you talk about the ladder going up and maybe you would show them that one, two, three, four, this equals this. Um, no, you are. That's very helpful. I think the ladder can be confusing because they put their their feet on each rung, which means yeah, so that they I'm then think talking about the space notes. And yeah, notes. that's basically the first bit of theory. What we find a lot happens in music mind games is that it takes them ages and ages and ages to understand that it goes space line, space line, space line. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things because you look at it and it looks like a ladder, and you talk about climbing the ladder. I think that's one of the things that is responsible for that is like that confusion. So when I'm drawing the stage, I'll say there are five lines they have all spaces. Mm. So uh, that I yeah. I, Do you yeah. teach me um like F A C E? Yeah. No, I do that. Okay, we're good. We're good to right? No, because that's learning by rote. So that's these are where these notes are. It doesn't help you learn anything else. Okay. If you know that every good boy you know that that bottom note's an E but doesn't tell you what's underneath it. So we learn the open strings there and the three C's to start off with, and then how to count up and down the stave and boys and obviously the alphabet, music alphabet. Um, thank you, Hannah. Very good. Uh, page 15. <laughs> I'm trying to say that alphabet backwards in G. <laughs> like, I could do that with my violin, but I can't. It's do weird, it, isn't actually. it? I always think about it as pitch rather than just letters. Yeah. If I think about a scale backwards, I can go, yeah. Yeah. A, G, F, E, D, C, C, the blah, 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 C, D. No, I'm now going wrong, anyway. <laughs> um, but if I just think about the letters, I'm, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the discussion of the resonant notes, um, on, yes, absolute pitch, 51. Absolute pitch is an awkward phrase because that's what people use to mean perfect pitch. So any note you hear, you could know what it is. Um, so I would say absolute pitch isn't the most helpful term there. I would have said that sympathetic resonance is much more helpful um, I mean, they're big words for little kids to learn, but they can learn. If they're big enough and clever enough to learn the violin, they can learn sympathetic resonance. Um, so that's really for you to have a look at at home. Uh, and page 56, sorry, I'm running through very quickly because I've got this much time. We are not teaching from the square of the arm. So just to be aware that that's like one of the things that we teach very differently in the UK and in Europe mostly. I find the hand shape of the kid weird as well there. It's like, yeah, it's coming from under too much. Well, that's exactly the reason that I prefer starting at the balance point, is that thing that we've been talking about. Like, if you start with that higher risk position, yeah. it's easier to come back to it than if you start there where you're going to be pretty much straight yeah. and then you go down. So, this is what they learn first. And yeah, if you look at the uh, yeah, posture things, like the girl on 64, her finger comes around loads. Her finger comes around loads. Yeah, I think I've got a different oh, edition. I've got the violin one. Uh, maybe, maybe you've got oh, one. a more updated one. I don't have. Or an older one. I've got an older one. Yeah, okay. The, f the photos on this are really old. Yeah. Quite a few of these don't are really old. That which, which, which finger are you talking about coming around the lot? That's that finger on the bow hand. Well, but she's not playing. That's a bit rough to assess her <laughs> accuracy in playing when she's holding the bow in the air. Really? Yeah. I look for the bow hold in the air. And a teenager like that. No, I don't know. <laughs> that has a teenager. Right. Um, 81, very quickly. 
Wait, but that might not be the same page. No, the pages are the same, I think. Review? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would just like you all to reread re this, um, you know, sometime soon, uh, because I know that you will have also obviously been focusing on the bits that you presented on, and that's brilliant, and now we've heard from um, about lots of it, but if you can just reread, review the review section, that would be great. And then just before lunch, we're going to discuss what's in 60. So I, I just think this is a really lovely way, I'm on page 60, developing musical direction in the playing. Hannah touched upon it, but the idea that creating a musical line is something that you can teach really early is one of the ways in which Suzuki is like quite different from many other teaching approaches. Um, and the old sort of uh, criticism of Suzuki kids playing like robots, this is one of the ways in which we can really make sure we're not playing into that stereotype of just teaching notes and rhythms and having, you know, seven-year-olds who can just like go through Lily Gavot without thinking about a single thing um, musically. So we're thinking about the idea of every note being a travelling note or a destination note. You can do the, um, we'll do it now. What page are we on? Six. D. Kit, choose a piece for me. Do you need to go? I don't mind. Um, Not very um, early, but fun. Happy Farmer. Happy Farmer, okay. So anytime I get to an important note, can you put your hand in the air and put it back down when you think it's not an important note? How does Happy Farmer go? <laughs>
and that lasts that will last you quite a long time. You can have those conversations in book six, you know. Um, so I think that's that's a really useful way to bring the musicality into your teaching. Um, and I think also, like, so if you look at page sixty-three, my first rule in making music is never to play the same note or group of notes the same way twice. So that is a really basic option, like rule, isn't it? Um, and so the idea that you can you can say to your students, okay, well, if we're going to have this twice over, do, 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 that then gets repeated. What are we going to make different the second time? How can you make it? How can you make it not boring by just playing that basically four times in a row? Um, and and then later on, more in the baroque stuff. Okay, so you've got these basic choices. You can play it loud, quiet. You can play it quiet, loud. You can play it loud, getting quieter, twice over. You can you know you could like what what shapes can we make with the sound? And I think with the young ones, it's really great to do things like the feast that we did for Mignon, as um, that's helpful for. Uh, memory, but also for kind of like uh, musicality, and um, and and particularly like uh, with a song like Lully, for example, to think about characters. So I literally did this with my student yesterday. We're going to make this about your friends, you and your friends at school. So who is the cheeky? Dun, dun, dee, 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 Oh, that's my friend Neve. Okay, who's the one that might get a bit shouty sometimes? Do 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 do. Oh, that's Sybil. Okay, and who's the do, 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 just trying to keep the piece? Do, 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 the please don't have around. Do, 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 do. Oh, that's me. And then here's Neve. Do, 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 and then she runs away. Do, 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 do. Everybody chases her, and then she's hiding. You can't find her. Do, do, do. Where is she? And then she comes out. Do, do, do. Here I am. And like just little stories like that will make it about animals or make it about your family. Do try to avoid the gender stereotypes of the loud, angry bits being dad and the nice, calm, you know, uh, placating bits being mum. But um, I think all of those kind of ways in which you tell a story with your music can really make sense to a kid. And, the, and then the parents will often be like, oh my God, it sounds so different when you play it like that than it does when you just play it. Delight so heart. it really can bring it to life for them. Mm -hmm. And the joy is the first priority, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you all very much. Let's meet at quarter past two. And this afternoon we are doing teaching points for, um, hopefully finishing book two. And then later on we're gonna do bath double. <laughs> oh no, we're going to do bath double next week because we're going to do sight reading. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll do sight reading next. We'll do sight reading at quarter past two and then at three we'll do teaching points because then we can just see how far we get. Okay. Cool. Great. Well done, everyone.